conscious experiences are fundamental, right? So then in under that idea, mathematical structure is only about one thing, consciousness and conscious experiences. And in that framework, then you would, Gödel would be telling us that there's an infinite variety of conscious experiences with an infinite variety of, of different structures. And most of us have no idea that there's anything else, right? This is the only candy in the store and, and, and we're happy, but this is just one of the boundless candies. And, and um, it's, it's fun to wake up to that. It may be frustrating too, if we sit here and going, but, oh, but I can't experience them. <laughs> and by the way, even the mathematicians, uh, based on Gödel's incompleteness theorem, even the mathematicians can't abstractly even begin to explore just the mathematical structures, right? But by the way, this is great job security for mathematics. This is provable job security. This is, you will never come to the last theorem, never. So this is, sign up for being a mathematician because you know that you have endless employment. <laughs> I'm not wedded to evolutionary game theoretic kind of model of the dynamics of consciousness. Mm -hmm. I have to be open to a, a much wider range of possible dynamical systems, right? Interesting. It's in general going to be simply some kind of dynamics on graphs. It's really critical to walk away from dogmatism. Yeah. Right. That's th that's dogmatism is the source source of all this, and it, you know it seems like um, most spiritual traditions would recognize that that humility is a virtue, yeah. and I would include in that humility about my beliefs, humility that I could be wrong. It's an anti-dogmatic kind of point of view. It's more um, exploring and and. If we assume that we know, then we cut off inquiry and we can't learn. If you know, if, you, if you're certain that you know, then you're not going to be motivated to learn. No, someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very pumped to be talking about conscious agent theory. We have Dr. Donald Hoffman joining us on the show. Hi, Don. It's a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Alan. Very pumped for this episode. Super excited for all that you're pushing at the edge of what's known. For those who don't know Don's background, he's professor and recently became emeritus of Cognitive Sciences at UC Irvine since 1983, 37 years author of 120 plus academic papers, and most recently author of The Case Against Reality, proposing a conscious agent theory of everything. And you can find his links in the bio below to his website, also his book, The Case Against Reality, as well as his Twitter profile. Check out all those links. All right, Don, obviously we were both extremely passionate about metaphysics, the nature of reality, the nature of being, the nature of consciousness. And this seems to be obviously like, seems to be the most first principled question that we must have children and adults that, caring about. But one of the big arguments that you propose is that the, re, the, the reality that, that, is, that this is actually makes it so that we are tuned to not that fitness function. We are not tuned to the fitness function of understanding who we are, metaphysics, but we are rather tuned to uh, getting fitness points and procreating. So you would, would you say that that is the, the main sort of uh, uh, reason why there's so few people that are studying metaphysics, nature of consciousness, this type of stuff? Right. So, so yeah, what I'm up to is what we do in science all the time, right, is we take our best current theories and we push them. We try to find out what they entail. And we try to find surprising implications of the theories and we try to break them and that's the goal is to push our theories to the limits try to break them and and then we learn something and then we try to go to the next theory and so that's what i'm doing with the theory of evolution but natural selection i'm really just saying you know whether or not the theory itself is true right we you know I, i'm not claiming that the theory of evolution but natural selection is true it's the best tool we have so far it's an incredibly powerful tool we have nothing better so that's what i've got to study and so the question is do, you know, according to that tool, according to evolution but natural selection, would we be shaped to see objective reality, whatever that objective reality might be, 
And um, most people would think intuitively, of course, we, you know, you know, it, it makes you more fit if you see the truth, right? If you, I mean, surely someone who sees reality as it is, is going to be more fit um, and have more kids than someone who doesn't. But, uh, you know, those intuitions are strong, but the math of the theory of evolution of natural selection is very, very clear. The probability is zero that any of our senses, not just for humans, but for any creature, will ever be shaped to see any aspect of the structure of reality, whatever reality might be. So it's, it's, it's uh, again, I want to make sure it's clear that this is from from a, a scientist point of view, it's not like I'm saying evolution is true and you, you know, deal with it. I'm saying, no, this is just, I mean, this is our best theory so far and we may come up with a better theory, but here's what our current theories say. And it's a surprise uh, and, and, and it's a mathematical theorem. So if we don't like it, we may need to try to adjust the theory of evolution with natural selection, or we may have to live with it and say, well, no, this is the way it is. This is very, profoundly important because when we look around ourselves at the world at large, we don't see people obsessively compulsively studying truth and wanting to understand the nature of reality. And a lot of the time we think that, oh, well, that's maybe based on the economics and the incentive systems that make it for people to just funnel in as cogs into like an economic machine. Um, and there's been lots of philosophical conversations around the desacralization and the and the there's n not as much divinity, not as much uh, mo a little bit more nihilism, maybe uh, given today's uh, entrance into the AI age. And so, this is extremely, extremely important that children born to the world, adults today, are wondering what is what is consciousness? What is this awareness? Do we share this conscious awareness? How do I study this word that's infinity? How do I study this word that is eternity? What is a theory of everything? What does that even mean? Why should we care about it? So part of it seems to be, yes, some economical incentive structures need to be pointed towards that direction for people to study truth rather than just uh, the procreation and getting points um, for in that sense. But also there's some overlap there that, that, um, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Would, would you say that, you know, you've used this analogy so many times and it, that's just because it's so salient and it's so relevant and young people today that are especially um, millennials, Gen Z and Generation Alpha for sure understand this more than um, the older generations do. But the idea that that we ourselves are as a as a desktop user interface or as a as a virtual reality uh, headset that we ourselves when we use these objects like this glass of water i know that i sip from the glass of water and it gets me the fitness points in terms of not uh, dehydrating and continuing to live so that i can procreate um now now that object has a higher weight than does the object of me um, reading about Sri Aurobindo and the Mother Miral Fossa and their understandings of metaphysics, and mm -hmm. so, so the idea is that this is an icon in my in my on my on my user interface on my multimodal user interface. It's an icon, but underlying this icon, at the very depths which we're which we'll get into here in a moment there is some sort of a there is some sort of a source code of that object i don't manipulate the mathematics the voltages the transistors etc i don't manipulate those things just like when you play grand theft auto or world of warcraft or minecraft you yourself don't go in and you don't when you drive a car you're not manipulating the codes that do the left all you do is you turn left in the car so that sort of these theories around desktop interface faces these theories around virtual reality headsets um it's interesting because they're what is kind of the cutting edge technologies that exist today but also they are in a sense the most relevant ways of of conceptualizing this theory and i think you did a really good job at at putting them together in order to get this interface theory of perception in order to get this conscious agent theory but that's this general idea is that there is some sort of a of a of an abstract mathematical source codes that are occurring that are then creating some sort of a holographic space time uh, for us to then be conscious agents inside of that then we interact with uh, the user interface of objects for the fitness points of procreation is that approximately correct 
Right. So, so th that's right. The theory of evolution by natural selection clearly entails that our senses have been shaped not to show us the truth, whatever the truth might be. And by the way, to prove the theorem, we didn't have to actually assume we knew the truth. We could prove it without knowing what the truth is, which is very, very interesting that math is, allows us to do that. But it, and so it, it, the theory of evolution with natural selection clearly entails that um, using the kind of metaphors you were talking about, it's not like our perceptions were shaped to be a window on the truth. They're more likely to be shaped um, uh, as a user interface, like a game interface to a computer where if you're, as you say, as you're playing Grand Theft Auto, that, um, you might have no idea that there are voltages and magnetic fields and insides of trillions of, of, of you know, silicon, uh, you know, transistors and so forth in, in a computer. You, you would have no idea that that's what you're really playing with. And, and as you said, um, from an evolutionary point of view, there's um, very little constraint on from natural selection for us to want to understand ourselves at this deeper level, right? It's in some sense, if you've been trained you know, to play a game, um, you might not be inquisitive about who wrote the game. And so I mean, if you ask most kids who are playing games, who, who wrote it, that was like, I don't care. Well, oh, do you know about the voltages and magnetic fields? Who gives a rip? I mean, it's, I just want to play the game. And, and so you can, you know, there is some notion from evolution that might point in a different direction. And that is that, that our species from an evolutionary point of view is a bit unusual in that um, many species occupy a small number of niches, very, maybe very specific niches. And they, they have a limited set of fixed strategies that only work in, in certain small niches. And we've evolved um, a, a frontal lobe that has the ability to make models and we can play with these models of our environment and see what would happen in various circumstances and see if we would be injured. So we could die in our model as opposed to dying in person in, in, in the environment. And so one could imagine how that kind of capacity, which was originally evolved to model our environment and how it's hurting us or, or helping us, that we could then all of a sudden sort of co-op that to reflect on other things, right? We're model builders and all of a sudden we start to wonder, and, and, and part of the thing is there's a sense in which we mo want our models to be right because if our models aren't, aren't right, they won't protect us, right? So there is again going to be this built-in wish that for us to have good models. And so one could go and in, interact in that direction and, and try to come up with an evolutionary story about how our species might be sort of selected to want to have some kind of notion of truth that sort of maybe builds on this model building thing, which wasn't about truth, it was about staying alive, but there was a sense of truth of the model in the sense that it's, it's the true way to play the game, right? So there's this true way, I mean, if I'm playing Grand Theft Auto, I would like to know that if I turn the wheel left, uh, my car's not gonna go to the right. I mean, that's, that's a true model within Grand Theft Auto. It's not true in terms of the diodes and resistors and the voltages, but it's true within the context of the game. And so mm -hmm. one could try to tell, craft a story like that where evolution sort of shaped us to be model builders in the game. And we wanted our model of the game to be accurate. And that then extended to a few people more philosophically going, whoa, um, could this just be a game? And could I try I mean, to, to get a model of it? So, so I'm not saying that that's a true story, but I'm saying it's, it's an interesting way that we could try to go within the evolutionary theory. But I, I do wanna say that the, the next step that I've taken about conscious agents is entirely independent. Mm -hmm. Nothing about conscious agents is dictated by the theory of evolution by natural selection. Mm -hmm. All I'm doing there is I'm saying evolution by natural selection is telling us that there's a reality that's different from space and time and physical objects, utterly different from it. And so as a scientist, I'm trying to think, okay, well, okay, so it's not space and time and physical objects, what is it? And since I'm interested in consciousness and, and what's called the hard problem of consciousness, how are our conscious experiences, like the taste of chocolate and the smell of garlic, related to brain activity? And I'm trying to solve that problem. That's why I sort of said, okay, let me propose that 
consciousness is the fundamental reality. And as a scientist, I need to give a mathematically precise definition of what I mean by consciousness. And so it ended up being, as I studied it with my wonderful colleagues, Chaitan Prakash and Manish Singh and Chris Fields and, 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 and others um, who, who work with me, it's not by any means by myself alone, um, that we came up with sort of this network model of, it's, it's like a vast social network of conscious agents, but that's a separate hypothesis. One could buy the argument from evolution of natural selection that we don't see the truth, and then say, but I don't like your theory about conscious agents, yeah. I'm gonna put something else for the reality. So that's yeah. perfect. Or you could say, I don't like any of them, but then <laughs> to look at the theory of evolution of natural selection and, 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 and figure out what you think is wrong with my theorem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. I'm glad that you're bringing up the sort of, whatever we end up hypothesizing as an ultimate reality that is beyond what seems to be just a, a user interface that whatever we hypothesize as that it must unfold a quantum field theory, a space time and an evolution by natural selection. Right. So th that's really some key is that whoever is trying to conceptualize whatever it may be at the most abstract mathematical level happening, it has to unfold um, those three keys, but it also, it also has to uh, unfold um, a, 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 the conscious agents experience that has a, a, a combinatorial essence to it that um, that I interact with the cup, I drink the water. That's a very, very common experience amongst co conscious agents is drinking water. It's a lot less of a common experience among conscious agents to have a Rube Goldberg uh, book or music or company idea um, and execute that into the world. So there are these rarities uh, and then there are these more commonalities. I want to I want to ask you about um, would it would it be fair to also kind of call this like in a you know is this, is source code an okay word for it is implicate like David Bohm would say is that an okay word for it are these okay interchangeable sorts of sure. yeah. Absolutely. as long as we recognize they're just metaphors I mean the, the the real point of the theorem for natural selection is that there is a reality whose structure is utterly unlike any structure of our perceptions, almost surely. And so, so, you, so we can use various metaphors and you know, source code is a great one. If I'm thinking about it as a user interface, absolutely. David Bohm's uh, you know, he, he, brilliant, brilliant quantum theorist, um, his implicate order, trying to think out of the box um, there. But as you, as you pointed out, um, whatever we put in that deeper realm, whether it's source code or implicate order, or in my case, con a network of conscious agents. Um, if we're gonna do science, we can't just wave our hands. We have to have a mathematically precise statement, in my case of conscious agent networks, and as you pointed out, then um, there have to be testable predictions that uh, in principle could disconfirm um, what I'm proposing. And so there's a, some several things that, that any real scientists would require of, of my theory. It would, they would require that, you know, at some point before we can really take it seriously, you better show how space-time emerges. And when you show how space-time emerges, uh, you better get the sciences that we have of space-time, you know, general relativity, special relativity, quantum field theory, or generalizations of those theories. Uh, but, but, you, but you can't do worse. You, know, you can't do worse than those theories. You've got to do those theories or better. And also evolution by natural selection. And so, so this is not uh, just, well, I think it's consciousness and wave our hands and so forth. We, we have some hard work ahead yeah. to, to um, for example, make specific predictions about um, how the dynamics of conscious agents can tell us precisely the, say, the the amplitudes for scattering events at the Large Hadron Collider. Right? We, we have to be able to do that kind of, of concrete prediction of eventually. I mean, I can't do it right, right now. I and my team are working on it, but, but I absolutely accept that until we have that kind of prediction, testable prediction, um, we're not there yet. Yeah, I wanna, let's, let's go into the 
um, the abstract mathematics first, and then I want to go into the um, super macro scale conversations around um, the infinite candy store analogy. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll get there in a, in a moment. So, okay. In terms of the math of the conscious agents, um, we're running what uh, John Maynard Smith, this evolutionary game theory style, evolutionary simulations, and there's, there's, there's several components to it. And correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, and then if, if not, we'll have you elaborate on it. Would the first component being a category theory? And that basically being like the agents themselves um, and the uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning, we could, we could say, maybe. Um, then we have Markovian morphisms, the Markovian kernels. We have the, the explorations that are happening. Um, we kind of called this the earlier you were talking about like a Monte Carlo tree search and a model-based reinforcement learning um, style uh, for the agents to explore and morph. So the actual sets of the agents, um, those sets, those category sets, they morph over time um, based on the experiences that the agents undergo. And then there's a replicator equation for procreation so it's three, so it's three things. So replicator creation, procreation. And I believe you said that you don't have the quasi-species model yet, which is for mutation, but that though that these are kind of, would you say these are kind of the abstract components is the category theory, the Markovian morphisms, the replicator equation, the quasi-species model. Is that approximately in the right ballpark? Well, certainly that's, that's true when we're doing our um, simulations just of evolution by natural selection, right? So so John Maynard Smith um, transformed Darwin's idea into beautiful mathematics back in the 70s. And this is called evolutionary game theory. And so, in fact, I used, I and my graduate students, uh, Justin Mark and Brian Marin, used John Maynard Smith's uh, you know, evolutionary game theory to, to first run simulations. Before we had the theorems, we ran the simulations just to see if, they, if it was worth our time, right? You, know, you, you just want to see what's going to happen before you spend your time on the math especially when you have uh, limited math talents like me. So, so we ran the simulations first, and there we did find that, uh, you know, organisms that saw reality, virtual organisms in our simulations that saw reality went extinct when they competed against ones that, uh, of equal complexity that saw none of reality and were just tuned to the fitness payoff. So, so that's what led me to then go to a real mathematician, Chaitan Prakash, and, and pursue the, the theorems. Now, in the case of the agent dynamics, um, I'm not wedded to evolutionary game theoretic kind of model of the mm -hmm. dynamics of consciousness. Mm -hmm. I have to be open to a, a much wider range of possible dynamical systems, right? Interesting. It's in general going to be simply some kind of dynamics on graphs. So the general mathematical arena is these graphs mm -hmm. and dynamics on graphs, which is a fairly recent and quite complicated a branch of mathematics. Now, one constraint will be that whatever dynamics I come up with of conscious agents, when I project it into the headset into space time, I need to show why it looks like we get John Maynard Smith's specific kinds of evolutionary dynamics in the headset, right? That has to come out. But it, I don't have to put it in to begin with in the level of conscious agents. And that would actually be more impressive if I had some more general kind of dynamics or some kind of different dynamics. Uh, and that then very interestingly, when I project it, looks like evolution by natural selection and the you know, evolutionary game theory. So right now I'm just pursuing, but category three, I think will be a big part of it, right? Right now we, we're, we're using Markovian dynamics on, on graphs. Um, but we we're thinking that for the bigger picture of how agents interact and combine to form new agents, we may have to go to a category theoretic representation that, that's more general than the Markovian dynamics that, that we're looking at right now. So maybe um, monoidal, monoidal categories to begin with. Um, it's so, so, so interesting. So um, the so the con so conscious agent theory, the conscious agent dynamics are occurring on graph and on yeah that and that's kind of the the and then the conscious agents get ascribed 
the Allen conscious agent gets as- ascribed a, a a a category set of 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 um, for example, like your your DNA may be in there, something a lot, something like that. Maybe your 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 the the morphisms that that uh, that that agent undergoes may be like we described earlier this most common morphism of drinking the water which then enables the agent to live another day because they've imbibed water versus having the you know the rube goldberg transcendent idea of a business that they build uh, incessantly, obsessively f- over five years actually gets them a very serious long-term fitness payoff. Um, so, and which gives them a better, uh, a better stance on the hierarchy for in the replicator equation, the gen- their genetics will mate with the better uh, partner's genetics. Is it, is it taking in that, <laughs> that level of <laughs> processing? Well- Eventually, of course, we're going to, I mean, that's what we see in the interface, right? We see this kind of evolutionary dynamics and we see genes, we see DNA, we see this the, the replicator equation, we, we see reproductive success and failure. Um, and so those are things that, that we'll have to show at least are the way from the point of view of our, our space-time headset, our interface, that that's the way this dynamics looks to us through that. But it may be that it's that 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 point of view deeply misses a lot. Yes. Deeply misunderstands what's really going on with this whole realm of conscious agents. So, so I don't want to in any way restrict my imagination about the dynamics yes. of agents to anything, even about sexual reproduction and fitness. The whole notion of fitness and yeah. reproduction and so forth may be only an artifact of our headset just like space-time, space-time itself, the very structure of space-time is an artifact of our headset. It's not a deep insight into reality. So that's the, the weird thing. And the fun thing about the, the challenge of this is, well, so when, when I go after this theory of conscious agents, and, and you're asking exactly the right questions to, to really expose uh, what it means to try as a scientist to go to a level of, of a theory that goes beyond space-time, right? You, you, you have to, on the one hand, be constrained ultimately by empirical things that we can measure inside our interface, like DNA and yeah. you know, fitness and, and survival and so forth. But our ideas can't be constrained necessarily in this deeper realm. We really have to let our imagination go and ask the really tough question, which is first, you know, what kind of deeper theory do we want to go after? So I'm, I'm going after a theory of, you know, conscious agents and consciousness. Others that have, I, I should mention, tried to go a different way. I mean, so Seth Lloyd uh, was looking for something beyond space-time, and he proposed quantum bits and quantum gates. So, so there, and that's mathematically precise, and there's this just abstract world outside of space and time with these quantum bits and quantum gates, and he was able to show how with each quantum gate, the action of the gate um, corresponded to the curvature of a little patch of, of relativistic space-time, you know, gravitational, you know, general relativistic space-time. And he could get, um, he could sort of boot up general relativity from this, this deeper reality. Now, you, you could, of course, ask him, why in the world should it be that this deeper reality is quantum bits and quantum gates? Who ordered that and why? Why, why should that be the deepest reality? And we could scratch our heads about that, but but and, and that's a legitimate question. But I'm just saying that once you go and say space time isn't fundamental, there's lot, there's countless ways that we can go as scientists to look. And so for me, the, the, so it's it's a non-trivial choice to say I'm looking for consciousness, and, and my motivation was simply because I think I'm conscious. I think you're conscious. Um, if I'm wrong about that, and I could be wrong about that, then um, uh, boy, I'm wrong about pretty much everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I decided I wanted to propose a theory in which consciousness is fundamental um, and see if I couldn't do the hard work of showing that space-time emerges as just a headset to represent all these, this, this think about it as a big social dynamics, like the Twitterverse. Yep. So I'm proposing this big Twitterverse of conscious agents yeah. And but since it's you know like the Twitterverse, there's tens of millions of Twitter users, billions of tweets. 
what do we do is that you can't interact with all the tweets or the Twitter users. Mm -hmm. We need a visualization tool to see what's trending in New York, LA, zoom out what's happening in the United States, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in China, zoom in. What is, you know, what is Alan tweeting right now? So I should, you know, a good tool would let me zoom in to just Alan, zoom out to what's happening at the whole United States. That's what our headset is. Right now, my headset is representing most of the conscious agents with really dumb symbols like tables and chairs and so forth. Not because tables and chairs are conscious. Just like if I have a, in my headset, I've got something that's representing what's trending in the United States. You know, some red objects are doing something over here in green objects. It's not that red object and green objects are conscious or, or Twitters. That's just how my interface codes the stuff because it has to give up. But I'm not giving up so much when I interact with you. I'm actually interacting with a specific consciousness and you're interacting with my consciousness. And so, so our headset in many cases will just use really crude symbols that we call just inanimate physical objects. That doesn't mean anything deep. It just means that our symbols are, have to give up. Right? There's no, in this point of view, there's no fundamental distinction between living and non-living. That's an, the, it, we think it's a fundamental distinction in reality. It's just where our, our interface symbols are more or less insightful about the conscious agents that we're interacting with. So, so there's no fundamental principle distinction between living and non-living. Non and there's no way that, that life just boots up from the unconscious ingredients of our interface. So, so this changes the whole, the whole point of view. But to get right back to your, your, your question, what we have to do in this theory of conscious agents and this dynamics is not assume John Maynard Smith's theory. We have to get it coming out as a projection of a deeper dynamics. And so yeah. we have to ask, and this is the really fun part and the creative part for scientists. You have to ask, um, every theory has certain assumptions. What are, and we want to have as few assumptions as possible, right? Because everything you assume, you're not explaining. So, right, every, every time you put something into an assumption, you're saying, can't explain that, so that's an assumption. So you want as few assumptions as possible. And, and so there's no theory of everything, right? There is no scientific theory of everything because every theory has some assumptions that will not be explained by that theory. So there's, there are theories of everything except my assumptions. <laughs> that's, the, that's what science has. We have theories of everything except my assumption. And of course, then you can get a deeper theory which tries to explain those assumptions, but it'll have its own new assumptions, right? And so science always will have this limit that we only have theories of everything except my assumptions. And so, I, so my theory of consciousness is no exception. I will have a theory of consciousness except my assumptions. And so my assumptions are that there are conscious experiences, like the taste of chocolate, the smell of garlic, the headache, and that those conscious experiences can affect other conscious experiences. So they, they inform actions that affect other conscious experiences. That's it. That's, I just want to say those two things. So it's, I mean, so notice I'm not saying anything about a self or self-awareness or self-consciousness, not saying anything about memory or learning or intelligence or problem solving. Uh, there's all these things that I'm not saying. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're not part of the kitchen sink that I'm throwing into my theory. These are all things that I'm saying I will have to explain. The only thing I'm going to let myself have is two things. There are experiences, and experiences inform actions, and the only actions are to affect other experiences. Yeah. That's it. With those, so that, that minimal structure, my hope is to say, um, I can then give you a theory in which we build selves as data structures. We have, we can build theories out of networks of, so this is going to be the dynamics of graphs. It's going to be graph dynamics in which we show how to compute things like memory, learning, problem solving, intelligence, and so forth. And, and by the way, uh, it's a theorem from our mathematical statement of the assumptions I just gave you. There are experiences and they can affect other experiences. By writing it down as Markovian kernels, as we have, it's, it's a trivial theorem that um, th this framework is computationally universal. And, and what that means is, um, in principle, there is uh, no limit. Uh, any theory that we could build of learning, memory, problem solving, or intelligence using computers, I can build with my theory of conscious agents. If you can do it on a computer, I can build a theory in this new language of conscious agent networks. So that's so. So I know from the get-go that I have an adequate 
but minimal set of assumptions that lets me build all these theories. I can build a theory of learning, memory, problem solving, a self, and so forth out of this. The two assumptions that you made about experience being fundamental and also about experiences uh, impacting each, each um, other agents that then impact their actions, um, that those are pretty fundamental also to um, ancient spirituality, perennial wisdoms around the planet, which we'll talk about also um, later. So I, I appreciate how you say that there's, there's many different ways to up the source code mountain. And okay. I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I like that a lot. There's a lot of, um, like Brian Keating just had Stephen Wolfram and um, Eric Weinstein on, and they were uh, talking about the the nature of mathematical reality, and they were they were talking about the the hop vibration, and they were talking about how um, that vibrational data is um, is 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 a is a big deal and it's happening in that's happening infinitely far away and then it it, it emer and then it, the emergence of it and and um and and to me um that style of thinking and, and visualizing i think is also important i don't know where that lands on on the mountain towards the source code um and where that would incorporate a a conscious agents or 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 if that would happen downstream or whatnot. So for, I really appreciate how there's many different ways up the source code mountain and that there's different ways to, um, to, to speak about and visualize it. Then there's, there's, well, let's, um, let's mention, let's mention this. Um, you gave, you gave a really good just bit there um, a moment ago on how the, the, the conscious agent does not see the, and I think this, this is extremely important, but like the rain of photons that are coming right now and this big um, field of nitrogen and oxygen uh, molecules in front of my face, um, the electromagnetic spectrum that we only see from 400 to 700 nanometers on. Um, the fact that we don't see any of those things is precisely be because it, we potentially designed it this way so that we could act in the ocean of that we're in uh, to have experiences because if you couldn't have those experiences if you were blocked by the ocean of the electromagnetic spectrum and the sea of oxygen and nitrogen that you're in does that generally about right too right from an evolutionary point of view that would be the kind of argument that um you you want to evolve sensory systems that tell you what you need to know to act in ways that will keep you alive, you know, that, that will keep you fit. But um, you want to do it as cheaply as possible, right? Every calorie that you spend on perception is a calorie that you have to go out, kill something, and eat it to get that calorie. So there are selection pressures for us uh, to, to dumb things down, to keep our senses as simple as possible, um, given the, the other pressure of they have to be complicated enough to accurately report fitness, at least more accurately and, and more fitness than, than your competition. There's, there's nothing that in evolutionary theory that says that you are perfect about seeing fitness either, right? So I'm not, I'm not being um, a theorist that says we're, we have veridical perceptions of, of even fitness payoffs. There's, there's nothing veridical here anywhere. We, we have what we call satisficing solutions in evolution, right? Is good enough to just beat the competition. And so, so in, in, from that point of view, from an evolutionary point of view, and, and again, you, you can see my attitude is, look, I'm not saying that evolution by natural selection is true, uh, but I'm saying we have no better theory, right? That, that is the best theory we've got. So, so until we have a better theory, we've got to take it very, very seriously in, uh, in what it says, and then try to break it, right? I mean, be icon so we have to respect it, really study it, and then also try to break it. 
So, so what that theory is saying is, yeah, uh, there's no selection pressures for you to know everything, quite to the contrary. All you need to do is be a little bit better than the competition. And so why should we see the, the, the deep structure of, you know, of atomic nuclei or the, the wavelength structure of, of photons and so forth? And, and, and the fact that we in science, uh, you know, run into these things is, is interesting. What we're doing is we're studying our headset, right? Our headset has evolved with certain structure to it. What, like we have a, a space time that we perceive intuitively, you know, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. But when we actually study our perceptions more systematically, we, we realize, you know, Einstein comes along and, and, and uh, comes up with surprising features about our interface that eventually lead to posing that there's a Minkowski structure to space-time. And then eventually even a curved space-time, you know, he comes up with a, a, a curved space-time. And then when we, so what's happening is we're taking the language of our senses, the language of our interface that was evolved, and what science is do, has been doing is studying our interface. We haven't been studying objective reality. We've been studying our interface and its structure. And even microphysical particles like quarks and gluons and leptons um, are, the physicists will tell you, they're just what they call irreducible representations of the Poincaré group. But that means that they're, they're representing symmetries of space-time. We have this space-time format for our headset and particles are just representations of the symmetries of that of that formatting system, and so so yeah, we haven't seen all this stuff and, um, until science came along, and it, and what science has been doing is systematically exploring our headset, um, and 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 it's taken a lot of hard work, right? I mean, thousands of brilliant scientists working really really hard, which gets back at your main point, which in some sense from evolution we weren't evolved to see this, otherwise it wouldn't be that hard. We would just see it. So, so why, it, it just takes like, it takes an Einstein, it, it, it takes, you know, we, the people who actually figure this stuff out, we, we, we view them as absolute geniuses, right? I mean, the, because in some sense, the, the rest of us mortals uh, would never have even thought of that. And so there are a few of us, like the Einsteins and the John Wheelers and, 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 and so forth, who have these really deep insights um, and then the rest of us, um, you know, feel smart uh, by association. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, absolutely. A, a power law of uh, brilliant people that have pushed the edge of what is known. One billion people have been uncommon and 99 billion people have been common. And um, yeah, yeah. And the ones that are uncommon are the ones that uh, make the mutations on that uh, universal constructor um, that we're a, a part of. And the, then that tape, uh, then a hundred years later, we're all flying airplanes, you know, uh, style. Um, yeah. The, um, the, the other, the other thought for me around um, the perception, as you were indicating a moment ago, which I think is really valuable is that when 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 one augments their user interface when one augments their perception um in a sense what they do is they they kind of like climb the ladder of abstraction um but what happens is they like they see the world in a higher resolution like when when we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum in the sea of of oxygen nitrogen etc that that is that's here the photons etc all all that all that we're we're, we're, we've done is we've conceptualized these things, then we've stored it, but then we don't continue seeing it all the time. So, right. yeah. So, so this is a key insight, I think, is you rise to the levels of abstraction of knowing this, and then you store it as a concept. So like you double click in, you see the higher resolution, and then what you do is you zoom back out and you've stored that data and then you go about your the rest of your, um, the, whatever the function is. And like you described earlier, there's many ways up this mountain. So we're not just saying that it is only um, procreation, but that is definitely high and uh, truth is also high. The more that you know of, about truth, the greater chance you have of getting a mate as well. Um, but people that are tuned specifically towards um, 
of fitness payoffs, like you indicated, um, versus just truth payoffs, um, fitness payoffs will win out um, over that. But there is there is an an, an overlap there. But I, I appreciate that that understanding of of upgrading perception and then and then holding that as abstract concepts that you can access any time versus not even having. That. Right. Yeah, that that that's a good point in the sense that um, even the best of scientists when they reach some deep new understanding like quantum theory and you find that that these you know electrons and photons are in superposition states and they get entangled and so forth um the best and brightest you know like richard Feynman will say look um if you think you understand this you don't understand this no no one understands this this is just this is mind-boggling stuff and and so the, these geniuses who who are at the forefront of under working on it will will say that it it, it just shatters all of your your intuitions and from an evolutionary point of view you could say well no surprise i mean we weren't in some sense evolved to understand the subatomic world and and so our our concepts and intuitions just aren't matched to it and when we get there we get there by mathematics right the that we're forced to these conclusions because we we try to get some mathematics that will explain our experiments and when we get the mathematics and we finally, oh, wow, finally an equation that matches the data. So what does this equation entail? It entails that. Are you you got to be kidding me. It means that there's superpositions, that there is entanglement. Uh, I don't even know if this is it. it and, and so you, then you have the really brilliant people going, I have no idea what, what this really means. All I know is that that's what the math is saying and, and my intuitions are, are, are boggled. And so so that's that's where we are on that and there in terms of perceiving the truth and and, and getting mates um yeah mentioned um from an evolutionary point of view there is an interesting for for our species um there's an interesting sexual selection pressure so a male that has special linguistic or cognitive abilities can by showing off perhaps be more attractive to females that's just one way that you can show off you could also show off by being physically strong right and fast or muscle there's a number of ways of, of showing off but but there are some selection pressures for for women to uh, be more attracted um to to males with um, better displays of cognitive abilities. Mm -hmm. And and that can lead not necessarily to truth, but to just making up really impressive stories and and just trying to look impressive. So so, so it, the alphabet soup logical fallacy. Right. So so they're they're you know just performing in a way that makes you look impressive may or may not be necessarily moving toward the truth. Now in the case of an Einstein, right, um, um, but if you've stored this data, like if you've stored the quantum field around the tree with the exchange that is happening of photosynthesis between the human and the tree in terms of O2 and CO2, if you've stored that data, if you've stored also how you eat the apple that's went through the photosynthetic process of making the glucose, and then you eat that and you go through the cellular respiration process, if you've stored these pieces of data um, and you know them, and you can recall them, they give you a scientific and a spiritual fitness advantage in that sense over other potential mates for whoever that, that doesn't know that data. Absolutely, in, in the following sense. I mean, knowing that kind of stuff, I, I know um, things that could change my behavior so that I would eat more healthily and, and, and be more healthy that way. Or I could um, devise new technologies that allows me and my tribe to beat the others and and therefore be more fit and that's so absolutely that's one thing that's driven science is the need for technologies to fight other human beings <laughs> um so a lot of i mean so and and it works right it's you know the united states is the world superpower not because um we're the smartest people or the strongest people or the bravest people we just happen to have the best technology that that's 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 it there, that's so it's really in, in that sense, the fitness in an evolutionary sense goes now with great technology. In the past, it was, um, you know, who knew how to throw sticks and, and rocks better? And then 
figuring out levers and then bows and arrows, right? That was a you know, bow and arrow, unbelievable technology. It gives you an incredible advance until the other tribe figures out, oh, look what they did. And they, so now you get this arms race. And so that is, so you're, you're right that there is in some sense this, this uh, uh, fitness payoff for better and better technologies, absolutely. And, and that um, is one of the selection pressures, uh, sexual selection pressures. Women will be impressed not just with brawn, but also with brain yeah. in our species. Yeah. So, so interesting on that point. Um, let's, um, let's talk about, um, and everything that we just mentioned, would it be fair to say that those are upgrades in perception in your multimodal user interface, that these are upgrades that we can make? Like if your dashboard sees like from the old school days of how to make the bow and arrow or from today's modern day, maybe you know how to use Python to program a computer that maybe that if you have those little icons on your multimodal user interface, that maybe then in this interface theory of perception, if I can perform some mimesis and I can learn how to do the bow and arrow, or I can learn how to do the Python programming and add that to my multimodal user interface perception, that then, then that is um, the upgrades in perception, augmentations in perception that enable me to climb those ladders of, of fitness and abstraction and truth and stuff like that. That, that's right. It, it's, it's an upgrade, not in the sense of the basic hardware of the brain, right? The, the, the hardware of the brain that you got is what you've got. But you can, because our, our, our brains are, have evolved to be learning algorithms, and, we're, and we, we learn and build models, and if a lot of other people around us that we see have figured out models that we might not have figured out on ourselves, we can effectively be more smart because we can, instead of figuring it ourselves, we can just adopt their model. Now we have their model, even if we weren't smart enough to actually figure it out ourselves. And so as our population has gotten bigger, seven billion or eight billion and so eight forth. Billion, yeah. There, yeah. You know, right, there's, there's a, when you have that many people out there, there's gonna be some, some real geniuses who will come up with big ideas. Like there, there'll be an Einstein. And we, we, we all talk about Einstein and there are, a billion other people that we're not going to talk about from from 1905 <laughs> um yeah. that that and but the, the, the zero to one and then the one to many as peter Thiel would say yeah th that's right but there is the i'll tell the opposite side of this now and that's it's it's quite remarkable um our brains in some sense are not upgrading they're downsizing that's right yeah the, what is it is it the volume of a tennis ball we've lost in the last twenty thousand years that's exactly right. Um, so the peak was 15, 20,000 years ago. And apparently then what, what seems to be going on, um, well, well what, what is going on in the data is that they can measure the, the, the volume of the, of the skulls, the cranium, so that you can measure, you know, the brains are gone, but you can see the volume that they occupied. And so you can actually measure, and we've lost in the last 15, 20,000 years, um, 10%, 15% of our, our brain volume, or, or the, 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 about the entire volume of a tennis ball is gone. So it's, it's truly stunning. And, and, and apparently we got smart enough 15,000 years ago to create agric agriculture. And with agriculture, we started to get, now with, to support agriculture, you need to bring um, a bigger social group. We had small social groups as hunter-gatherers, but now you need to bring together bigger social groups. And you had to have a bigger division of labor because you know, we had to be you know, tending the crops, um, working on the crops. Um, we could then, we needed people to defend the crops because the hunter-gatherers are going to come through and just try to steal it from you, right? So you got to, now you have to have a standing army. They can't be always d doing the crops. And so you get this division of labor that's, that's coming out. But once you get a division of labor, um, I don't have to be smart about everything. Now, you, if I'm a hunter-gatherer, me and my small group, we have to do everything or we die, right? We have to make our clothes. We have to take care of ourselves when we're sick. Everything that we need, we've got to do ourselves or steal from somebody. <laughs> and, but in a, in a greater selection pressure for being a polymath 20,000 years ago, and then the slowly we've relieved those selection pressures today. That's right where you're just exchanging the sheet of paper for the apple <laughs> instead of growing it yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. IQ of 70 and just go to the store and get my food. 
Whereas, you know, I mean, if IQ of 70, probably, you know, during the 15,000 years ago, uh, I would have been run over. It, it, so it's, uh, you know, it's, so it's a use it or lose it kind of situation or, or use it, you only get it if you need it. And since um, I don't need to do everything, I don't need to be a, a genius at everything as much as before, I'm not. And so our brains are being downsized. I, I, as as also we're at least you know we have this access to the internet and we're moving into the genetic engineering the neural prosthetic ages that we're getting potentially the assistance of these AGI coaches and we can maybe learn how to augment our working memory to twenty um, plus or minus two and maybe we can abstractly reason such no novel concepts that have never been thought of before and um, but. Uh, so maybe there is a way to kind of bounce back from that loss. Uh, maybe um, that would be, that would be good. Um, and yeah, yeah. Um, let's, let's, this is good. That, that was a good bit on those um, augmentations. I definitely think that um, there's many other um, augmentations that, that exist like Entheogens is a is a prominent um, augmentation that exists. Um, deep the depth of meditative experiences, the deepest depths of those as well, um, augment one's perceptions. Also enable them to really um, understand what the pause is. Instead of being so reactive, they can uh, they know how to slow down and just observe, and then um, which is game changing for your relationships with your family, your friends, your coworkers, people online line, blah, blah. And so all of a sudden, just from something that doesn't appear to have a high fitness payoff, right? It doesn't appear to have a high fitness payoff. But really, when you learn how to pause instead of immediately react, um, it gives you tremendous uh, fitness payoff downstream. Yeah. I, I, I would agree in, in, in the sense that, especially like in, in our society right now, right? Um, most of us, aren't facing on a daily basis um, immediate threats to our, our bodies. But it's, you know, there, of course, I mean, there are many murders in the United States and around the world, but, but it's, you know, as, as Pinker has pointed out, as Stephen Pinker in some of his books, um, the rate of, of homicide is dropped dramatically over the centuries, dramatically. And, and so we have the luxury now of not having to look over our shoulders every moment, you know, w worrying whether some other human being from another tribe is, is going to be attacking us yeah. or, or so forth. And so, so it's, it's, it's interesting that if you're in a situation where you're in a war zone and um, there are imminent threats all the time, then being anxious and being alert is very, very fit. It's very, very important. Eventually, that anxiety and the cortisol that it produces will kill you, yeah. but it won't kill you today, and it, it will keep you alive today. So in that sense, it's more fit. But now, yeah. we have this luxury. We're not an imminent threat. There's not imminent danger. So if we're in the state of, of high stress and anxiety and so forth, producing cortisol all the time, we are unnecessarily shortening our lives. Yeah. If I was in a war zone, I would be necessarily shortening, shortening my life but to stay alive today. So, so with meditation and so forth, we can move into a greater sense of, of peace and reduced stress and anxiety. We can reduce our cortisol levels um, and we can enjoy that, that state of, of life. Now it's because of our, you know, from an evolutionary point of view, um, we are programmed with a stress system, right? We have an amygdala, we have all, the, we're, they're there um, because that's what kept us alive. We are the offspring of those who were anxious enough to be able to face the threats successfully, right? So that's why we have this proclivity to be anxious. Um, there are variations among us, but as, it, I mean, there's this video I saw in, in some a National Geographic um, show about nature or something with a bunch of monkeys in, in the wild, but they're well, all the monkeys are up in the trees and and hooting, hollering, and so forth, up, except for one. And this one monkey was this uh, really relaxed, laid back monkey out in the grass. On, you know, and while they're filming, they happen to some tiger or panther comes along, and guess who he got? 
Yeah, yeah. That that relaxation gene just went out of the gene pool. It was the only it was only the monkeys that were uptight and scared enough to stay in the trees that's that that passed on their genes. And so so we we are the offspring of those who were are you know anxious enough. So so from an evolutionary point of view, um, there's a clean reason yeah. why most of us face stress and anxiety, even when we don't have to, but we, we feel it when we don't have to. So evolution, uh, you know, programmed us that way, but, but meditation is something that we can now do when we have the luxury of not being in a war zone, not being attacked all the time, yeah. then we can, you know, take the bull by the horn and say, look, um, I don't need to be anxious all the time. Even though I've been programmed by natural selection to be anxious, I, I can choose to meditate and literally reprogram my brain circuits to be more relaxed. Uh, and I will enjoy my life more. Yep. And, and statistically, I will live longer. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's, there's many uh, variables in our user interface that uh, sometimes seem to uh, not have a high fitness payoff, but they're, um, because most of the high fitness payoffs just appear to be the short term gratifications um, and also the um, uh, things involving money. But the things that are sometimes involving learning how to do things that are maybe thousands of years old, like learning how to investigate your own consciousness and awareness and calm down and be, become more peaceful and joyful, that... Uh, doing that doesn't seem to immediately have a, a monetary or fitness payoff, but it, but I think there are many things like that, that exist that um, get you closer to, to truth, get you closer to peace and joy um, that actually do give you better downstream fitness payoffs. Because that's the thing is that mates given procreation um, men and women, both that don't have as uh, keen of an interest for truth. Um, there, they, in a sense, it feels like there's less soul there. There's more soul with people that have a depth of interest in truth. And also we as a society need to do a better job at creating the economic incentives that make it so that young children can explore metaphysics and consciousness as a profession and get paid for it too. So if there's, you know, money intertwined with truth more, more carefully, then maybe some of those conscious agents could win um, over people that just focus on fitness um, and, and, and money. So, yeah. Absolutely. And, and, and um, again, as I said before, you know, I, I, as a scientist, I'm always just sort of saying what different theories entail, right? And so I've been very, very careful to say that this is what evolutionary theory entails and so forth, but, but that I don't necessarily believe the theory. But now what you're saying is very interesting. Suppose, uh, you know, now, now forget evolutionary theory. Suppose that there's a deeper theory in which consciousness is fundamental. And in some sense, maybe the dynamics of consciousness is really, what it's about is the exploration of consciousness. That's what's really yeah. deep, meaningful in this deeper <laughs> realm of consciousness, right? And, and so, Perfect so segue. Yeah. then that puts a very different spin on the whole meditation thing than the spin I just gave, right? The spin I just gave was from an evolutionary point of view, which says uh, it, it's just a way of countering the, the built-in anxieties that we have. And so that was, that was, that was you know, bracketed within that theory. So now I'll put that theory aside and say, okay, that's what that theory entails. But there's this other framework entirely different in which consciousness is fundamental and it's what it's all about. So in that case, then meditation might not be just this side little issue to make us more comfortable. <laughs> be that that's only that's when we really wake up to what we're really about that, that maybe we're immersed in a game but the point of the game isn't to win the game maybe the point of the game is to wake up yeah realize who we are and maybe playing the game is a way of more more deeply understanding um who we are as conscious beings and and so maybe most of us just don't wake up in this game so but again notice i'm not saying that i know that this is true and, and that's the key thing. Dogmatism, from my point of view, is the is the the worst thing we we could ever have. Yeah. Dogmatism, assuming that I know the truth, is the way that you stop inquiry. So so I, I always want to say this is now I'm bracketing it with this theory. In a theory in which consciousness is fundamental, then it would it would have this different spin on things. And so that's what we we should always 
even if that's right, you can never know that you're right. That's the weird thing about this. So this is the human condition. We can never know if we're right. We can find out in many cases <laughs> that we're deeply wrong, but, but we can never, so there's this deep humility that we need to have in yes. anything that we claim. Um, it's rather, uh, so the way I like to think about it, I, I propose the theoretical framework in which I'm gonna speak and then say within that framework, this is what it entails, but of course the theory could be wrong. So here's, the, here's what evolution entails, here's what the theory in the, which consciousness is fundamental entails, um, but, but maybe both theories are deeply, deeply wrong, and so then let's talk about a different framework, right? And, and so that's how we, we... Yes, yes. The theories as opposed to being attached to them. Yes. It's an anti-dogmatic kind of point of view. It's more um, exploring, and, and if we assume that we know, then we cut off inquiry, and we can't learn. If you know, if, you, if you're certain that you know, then you're not going to be motivated to learn. Yeah, this is paramount. Um, balancing excitement with uh, non-dogmatism because you have to have confidence in what edge you're trying to push and you have to have humility as well. Uh, exactly. You're critical. exactly about that. That's, that's the knife edge. I agree with yeah. you. <laughs> See, it's not easy for us to, to maintain that, but it's really critical. It's so, so critical. Um, but because especially sometimes young people are, are trying to push with confidence something that may be actually really critical to get to the edge and beyond the edge. But then there are influences of maybe parents or community or friends that are just hating on them um, moving that forward. And so the, the, we, there's also the importance of, of, that, of that confidence and courage to, to get to, to that edge and to, to push it and rocket it forward. It's very important. Oh, absolutely. I think that, that you've touched on a really important point. I mean, so the, the theory that I'm working on right now, I, I'm excited about it. I've, I've got energy. I, you know, I think I'm onto something. But, and, so you, and you need to have that kind of energy and that kind of enthusiasm to push forward, right? But then you, I always step back and go, but of course I could be wrong. I mean, I hope I'm not, but you, be, you, but, you, know, you have to have that, that, that dual understanding about the whole situation. So yeah, be motivated, be excited. But, but not dogmatic. That's the knife edge. Yep. Yep. Those are some of the codes that we are archiving from the dirty bathwater is the dogmatism and the fundamentalism. And we're taking the baby out, um, the, the scientific method. We're taking out the hierophanies, these sacred divine communions and experiences, subjective ones that people do have and sharing those better. Um, I want to talk about the triangulation. Um, so there's obviously now we're talking about math, we're talking about science, we're talking about ancient spirituality, we're talking about consciousness, uh, we're talking about all of these uh, sacred sorts of, um, especially the last thousands of years that from axial ages, the explosion through uh, scientific renaissance and explosion there and scientific method and whatnot, coming together and triangulating on what this nature of reality is. And that I think it's interesting as we were talking about the source code mountain and all these different ways up in exploration, we, we kind of, we, 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 we may have mentioned this slightly um, that could it be that the, uh, that the ancient perennial spiritual wisdom of everything being one integration, everything being one thing, and then also having the small derivations like a calculus of consciousness, there's small derivatives of us, nerve endings, uh, having the conscious agent experiences and interactions and that cause actions to change and whatnot, that, that the triangulation of that and on um, the science that is being pushed uh, from like your conscious agent theory and many others are just pointing at this, the same thing over thousands of years or we're coming to the same thing. And that kind of maybe indicates that there is that one mountaintop with many different paths. I want to I want to see um what you think about the the candy store analogy is very strong. It's it's very strong. The 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 candy store um analogy for the conscious agent experience. And my question would be would be this. I've uh, I've been I've been struggling with trying to 
to understand this, that for thousands of years, there have been ancient spiritualities that have talked about how everything that is possible already is. That's what infinity is. Infinity is everything that is possible. It's all the combinatorics that are possible are already happening. And, and the being, beco becoming is the only being. So it's just an infinite amount of becoming always eternally happening and that all the combinatorics that exist do. But then there's Kurt Girdle and there's this incompleteness theorem and there's this idea that it's, in, it's impossible to ever be everything. It's impossible to ever be all the combinatorics possible. So are we, are we, are we already exploring all of the combinatorics of the infinite candy store always and always will? Um, or can we never explore all of the combinatorics of the infinite candy store and therefore, um, and, and, and maybe um, the Ouroboros uh, it could, I can bring that in as well. Just that, that as we evolve to whatever the Godhead attractor is that we're going towards, maybe the recursive function is to just continue tasting more of the candy store combinatorics as conscious agents and that's that transcension hypothesis at the godhead that we just go inward for more exploring so take us on that journey of those two options and then on we'll get to that recursive godhead right so girdle when he was only i think years old or 25 years old 25 yep crazy when, he, when 1931 he he <laughs> Did one of the most brilliant things ever in human history. He he proved his incompleteness theorems, and and effectively, what he showed was that if you have any set of like axioms, assumptions for a mathematical system that's rich enough to do arithmetic, then he showed that there will always be statements that are true, mathematical statements that are true, but you cannot prove from your axioms that, 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 that so these are unprovable truths. They're truths that are unprovable. Now you can imagine the genius that it would take to prove that there are unprovable truths, what he did. And now if you take those truths that are unprovable and add them to your axioms, you might think, Oh, well then I'm done. But then he proved, no, there will be yet new, truths that are unprovable within the richer axis. And so what this means is that there is no end to exploration of mathematical structure. Uh, uh, it's, and it, it, this seems to be an, an unending exploration that, that even an infinite wisdom could never get around, right? That, that there's a sense in which you can't ever be smart enough to comprehend the whole thing. This is, this is pretty deep. This is, an exploration that in principle appears to never ever be possible to stop in principle. Like, like the infinite um, men, Benoit, Benoit Mandelbrot fractal zoom. That, that's right. But this is a kind, I mean, there, if you take the, um, the real line from zero to one, there's an infinite number of points, but, yeah. but you can see them all, right? There, there, there's some sense in which it's comprehensible. This is different. This is like, yeah. yeah. It, it's it's unending, and so now how it relates to the the consciousness stuff and what you were talking about is, um, if now I'm again bracketing with respect to a particular theory, right? So suppose we adopt the theory in which consciousness, conscious experiences are fundamental, right? So then in under that idea, mathematical structure is only about one thing, consciousness and conscious experiences, and in that framework then. You would Gödel would be telling us that there's an infinite variety of conscious experiences with an infinite variety of, of different structures, and and that may be a little strange to a lot of people to talk about experiences being structured, right? But if you if you think about just your experience of the, of the world around you, there's up, down, left, right, forward, and backward. There's there's a structure, a three dimensional structure to your to your space, and. And there's a structure of color space. It turns out that, for example, red is a little bit closer to orange than it is to blue, right? There's this, there's, there's a closeness relationship that colors have in our, our perceptions. And, and everywhere, there's a field called psychophysics. 
that's been around since 1860. A guy named Gustav Fechner started it. But in that field, what we do is we study conscious experiences and their structure and their structure all over the place. So all conscious experiences, they're, they're, they're more than mathematics. So no conscious experience is just mathematics, but each conscious experience is structured. So I like to think of it as that the conscious experience is to the mathematical structure like the living organism is to its bones. So it's like mathematics is the bones of consciousness. Consciousness is not just its bones. It's, it's much richer than that, but it's not less than its bones. <laughs> it, 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 it has to have the bones as well. So, so what Gödel is telling us, under this theory that consciousness is all there is, that's its fundamental, is that there's this infinite variety of conscious experiences with an infinite variety of structures. So that's what I call Gödel's candy store, because these are now things to be experienced, like candies, right? You know, the kid in the candy store is like, let me try this one. Oh, that was great. Now let's try this new experience. Oh, I love chocolate. Well, I like caramel too. And uh, so what Gödel is inviting us in this, in this framework is to say that there's this infinite range of conscious experiences and no consciousness of any type, even the most glorified, can ever come to the end of the exploration. And so there will be this endless exploration of all the possible forms of consciousness, and we could actually think of Gödel's theorem as, as telling us that, that what it's about is consciousness learning more and more about itself as it explores more and more of its possibilities, yeah. but it will never end. And, um, and we're all, perhaps, are, quote unquote. We are that. We, we are that. Yeah, the, tatvam asi, the, um, we are that, or um, I and my father are one, yeah. That, that, that's right, and we're exploring it in a particular Minkowski space format with objects in space and time, and this is the particular little, so, but that's where, that fits in with this headset idea. Like, so instead of taking space and time as the final reality, in this bigger girl's candy store picture, it's, no, this headset that, that we've assumed was the final reality is one candy in an unbounding candy store. It's yeah. just one, yeah. and what, what so part of the waking up is to recognize this rookie mistake that we took this chocolate as the only candy in the store. This is the whole thing. It's, it's all about chocolate. Well, no, it's not all about space and time and what's inside space and time. That's just one little headset, one candy in the candy store. Wake up to all the infinite possibilities. Again. You mentioned, you mentioned this earlier, something like a Walt Disney or a Pixar style imagination, where if you do imagine what it is like to uh, evolve a, a headset that is non-carbon based DNA coded beings in a space time quantum field theory soup of natural selection that then maybe you can you can envision what other simulated uh, designs of, of realities look like uh, and you could even wander just a couple solar systems over and think about what it would be like um, you, you could even stay in this universe if you if you want and you could explore what what uh, alternative so so does it does it feel like that then we are already all of the infinite con candy store combinatorics always happening or that we can never be that and we are always endlessly exploring that well girdle seems to be saying we're endlessly exploring and and that that you're, you're right that we can certainly try to imagine and explore outside of the standard space-time kinds of things. Um, but there are certain interesting limits to this too that we have right now. So for example, if I, this is one of my favorite examples of this, if I ask you to imagine a specific color that you've never seen before. Oh yeah. But yes. Does anything happen? What? Mm -mm. That, suppose you're colorblind, right? So you're, you're a guy, you're, you're red, green, colorblind. And, and so there's this whole range of color experiences that you can't have that, you know, every, almost every woman has and, and, and color normal men have. So there's this red green distinction that you don't have. But if I ask a colorblind man to imagine red, well, he can't do it, right? He, he, just like you can't imagine a new color. I can't imagine a new color. So if, so there are some really, if I can't even imagine one simple color, I, I, I know colors, right? I've had mm -hmm. lots of color experiences, but all my imagination does not allow me to imagine. Go outside the color wheel. Right, yeah, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't do it. And, and yet we know that there are creatures um, 
But for example, there are some women who have four color receptors, not just three. Mm. So most of us have, you know, a long, medium, and short wavelength cone. But these women have apparently two versions of the long wavelength cone. And they, and in some women, they're all four of them are expressed in the retina. And when you do careful tests on these women, so Kimberly Jamison, a, a, um, a, a PhD um, researcher here at UC Irvine, who, who I know, has, she and others have done careful tests. These women give clear evidence that they're, that, that can be interpreted that they're in a richer color world than the rest of us. Just like us trichromats, we are in a richer world than the colorblind men. These women are in a richer color world than us. So they're having color experiences that I can't even imagine. I, yeah. I can't imagine what they, I can imagine abstractly that they're having them, but I can't imagine concretely any one of those experiences. And so that's the limit that we're gonna have right now, it appears. Yeah understanding of the possibilities in some sense we can understand abstractly the possibility of all these realms of all the, all the candies in the candy store yeah but until you taste the candy you don't know <laughs> <laughs> like yeah four percent of people are synesthetes and um there's creatures that see in the infrared and on the other side on the ultraviolet like there's a different species umwelt so the different um sp yeah so species are wearing different headsets and we could you know we can we took the uh channel uh rhodopsin for optogenetics and we took um the the uh the green fluorescent protein GFP for the um, for other biotech work that we've been using. So we've we we're borrowing from headsets, uh, from like user interfaces to uh, yeah. So um, this is very good if you can't imagine outside of the color wheel um, of our user interface, then it's hard to like Walt Disney or Pixar yourself out of uh, into like different universe designs as well. But um, I think virtual reality does a really good job at trying to slowly, in a sense, kind of like stretch out your color wheel beyond. Because um, when, when you go in, and these things are just getting more and more indistinguishable. So it, the, inevitably, it's going to lead to a point where, um, where you may be um, spending um, your eight your you're eight, eight, 80 years engrossed in the game because we've also hit the longevity escape velocity. So you can now live because we're just home. We're just, we're just, we're just engineering out any of the disease. We're just tuning the car or the plane. Um, we give uh, to like 15 year old homeostatic capacity of our body over and over again. So you can play for those 80 years and then, and then take it out and then just be like, wow, that was vanilla. That was great. And now it's like back to uh, caramel for now. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I think VR will help. I agree. It'll help stretch our imaginations. It'll help to take us in different places. And I think it will also help um, to understand the possibility that what we assumed was the objective reality, space. We, we assumed the space and time and physical objects, the sun and the moon and the stars, these are the absolute ground of, of reality. And, but someone who's actually, you know, the next generation that sort of grows up and spends a lot of the time in, in virtual realities that are just as immersive and compelling as everyday life, it's, it's, got, it's not gonna be, you won't have to be really a genius to take off your headset and just wonder, well, what about this? This is, this yeah. is just another headset. I mean, you, don't have, you won't have to be an Einstein to do that. It'll just sort of be like, duh. You know, of course, it's a possibility. I mean, if, if I can, if I, with this headset, am creating all these worlds that aren't there, then surely I'm creating this world around me and it's not there either. I'm, I'm, I'm the creator of it. Whatever the reality is, this is just a headset to that reality. So I think it will really help our imaginations that way. But in terms of concrete imagining of specific new kinds of color or other kinds of experiences, I don't know. Uh, short of taking drugs that sort of you know like you know open the doors of perceptions in certain raw ways um and maybe meditation could do that there may be some mm -hmm. technology that will do that but what we have right now the, the way that scientists do it is we go there with mathematics we, we let mathematics take us so for example can you imagine a three-dimensional cube sure can you imagine a four-dimensional cube 
nothing happens, right? <sighs> Einstein had to be thinking in four dimensions to write down his you know, equations for general relativity. He had to have a four dimensional, but he couldn't visualize it. So the mathematics was allowed Einstein to go where visual imagination couldn't. And now we can go five, six, 10 dimensions in mathematics and we can go there even though the mathematicians will tell you they can't visualize anything, and yet there's a way that our imaginations are going there because we have this cognitive lever, this tool that takes our, our ability to only concretely imagine three dimensions and leverage that into the abstract ability to work in any number of dimensions, but we can't visualize it. And so that's, so we can use mathematics to explore abstractly what's in Gödel's candy store, but it won't actually let us taste it. Wow. Okay. So we will be able to make all these novel combinatorics of candies. Um, the trick is going to be to enable us to actually taste that. Right. That's right. That's right. Just like, I mean, the, the simple problem, you can't... You know, imagine a specific color you've never seen before and nothing happens. Yeah. If I, if I discover all these new structures that consciousness can have and I say, okay, well, imagine what it's like. Well, you concretely won't be able to do it just like you can't imagine a specific color. So, so what we can do in some sense, what we're getting from the mathematics is, boy, are there all these really, really intriguing candies out there that are beckoning. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm telling you that they're there, but you can't taste them right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's, there's all, there's this, um, there's this, an, an infinite um, catalog of, of, of valence of, of conscious experience that is available of such wild combinatorics that are way beyond our own color wheel and tastes of candies. Um, that right now we're just talking about, but that nobody has tasted or experienced. And so we want to, we want to just shatter that and, and send lots of conscious agents out to experience that. Right. And that's from this point of view, from this framework in which consciousness is fundamental, that's what consciousness is up to. It's, yeah. it, it's shooting all sorts of explorations and we're, and you and I are just some of those explorations. We're exploring this particular candy in a particular part of the candy store and we are using Minkowski space and physical objects to do it. Um, and, um, and most of us have no idea that there's anything else, right? This is the only candy in the store and, and, and we're happy, but this is just one of uh, boundless candies. And, and, um, it's, it's fun to wake up to that. It may be frustrating too, if, if we sit here and going, but, Oh, but I can't experience them. <laughs> and by the way, even the mathematicians, uh, based on Gödel's incompleteness term, even the mathematicians can't abstractly even begin, to explore just the mathematical structures, right? But by the way, this is great job security for mathematics. This is provable job security. This is, you will never come to the last theorem, never. So this is, sign up for being a mathematician because you know that you have endless employment. <laughs> AGI will help us uh, create those novel um, theorems that help push the edges further. I want to I want to ask you about um, that Ouroboros. So at does does it then if we are um, creating the the if we if we are a one that is having the um, dissociative as Bernardo Castro talks about experience of of the nerve endings that we are having the experience in in the reality that we ourselves have designed and made that then um, <clears throat> that we of course must not get lost in the own um, in the own infinite labyrinth of our creation but we must um, go towards that that whatever attractor of a of a star that we're all in a sense like orthogenically um, building towards right now and is that star that we're building towards is that a recursion is that the transcension hypothesis is that all of us as conscious agents going through the process of making more experience, like t tasting more of the candies in the store. So is our recursive Godhead function to just taste more candies in the infinite store that we will infinitely forever eternally be exploring? Well, that is the kind of idea that, that I'm 
I'm pursuing here. So, so absolutely. And, and this, but this question really touches on something that you brought up before, which is that there are many wisdom traditions over thousands of years that have said very, very similar things. And, 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 and in some sense, as a scientist, I'm sort of a Johnny come lately, right? Science is sort of a Johnny come lately to this, but, but the science is, is, is coming along. But, but the kind of answer to the question that you just raised will require that we take all the insights from the wisdom traditions. And then we also take the rigors of the scientific method in terms of theory building and careful testing and bring these together in a, a synergistic interaction so that we, we find out from the wisdom traditions, deep, deep insights, right? They, they were there first in terms of saying uh, space time is not fundamental, like the physical world is not fundamental. And they've given us some informal pointers to what might be beyond, right? There, there's no mathematics there, there are, right? So now, now the Johnny come lately, science can, <laughs> hey, we, we now, now we realize that space time is doomed, that, that there's something deeper. And we can now start to build mathematical models that try to capture some of the insights of the wisdom traditions. And we can have this back and forth now between our intuitions on the one hand and then our attempts to make them precise. And, and why do we do that? Is it just to be pedantic and to be you know, over the top with mathematics? It's not that at all. It's that in some sense, you don't really know what you're saying until you say it so precisely that you could be wrong. That's when you are beginning to know what you're saying. So we will use in, in formal words, you know, in the, in the wisdom traditions, including words like God. And if I ask you precisely, what's the definition of God? You, you won't find it anywhere. So um, what we need to do is to try to make these intuitive ideas that the tra traditions have that are probably genuine insights, make them absolutely precise so that we can then learn and be surprised. Like, so for Einstein, for example, in I think around 1907 or so, he had this fundamental insight about gravity, that if he was in something like an elevator that was free falling, that you would, you would find, and you had a, a you know, a, a, something that could weigh you in the elevator, you'd find that you were weightless. You wouldn't weigh anything inside the elevator. And he, and he said that was like the happiest thought of his life because it was, it was the insight that gave him the general theory of relativity. But it took him something like eight years of struggle, really tough, emotional struggle, sleepless nights, pulling the hair out kind of, kind of stuff to turn that insight into finally, in 1915 or something like that, he got, he wrote down the equation and that's what it really means to say, if I was in an elevator, I would be weightless. But what it, and the reason you do it now is because then the mathematics is smarter than the person who wrote it down. That mathematics that Einstein wrote down, he didn't know it, but it entailed the existence of black holes. And when someone else, a year later, after he published it, some uh, some guy in the front lines of World War One, actually working on the equations, discovered um, a guy named Schwarzschild discovered this solution to Einstein's equations that there are these black holes, and Einstein did not like it. He disbelieved in black holes for decades. So here's a case where. We write down our, we take our ideas, including these deep spiritual ideas that we've had for thousands of years, we write them down mathematically, not merely to be pedantic, so that we can actually learn what we were talking about all along. Yeah. Falling in an elevator and being weightless means there are black holes. Well, who would have ever figured that out? Mm -hmm. And so the things that we say in the wisdom traditions, they're going to mean all sorts of other things that we had no clue that they meant. Yeah. until we get serious and write them down. So that's why I want to see this synergistic um, interaction between science and spirituality, like where we said. take the insights from the one and the rigor of the other, and then we learn, we get surprised. And that's, that's, that's the hope. 
Wow. Yeah, that's so well articulated. Um, the you you said this in another um, <clears throat> in another way as well that you become a student of your theory that the equations become smarter than the genius that wrote them down. That right. you're, 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 it's so spot on um, that that the the <clears throat> the flag that we plant beyond the edge of knowledge that we create hypotheses towards that just flowers a whole nother field that we weren't ready for we didn't know yet existed and the science of spirituality are those two driving forces that have gotten us um so far and that to where we are and so to bring them together and harmoniously test them i like using the the description where you think about like would have we done the manhattan project and dropped nuclear bombs on hiroshima and nagasaki if our science community was a little bit more spiritually, ethically, morally, philosophically awakened. But would we also, would we, would we, um, would, would we have all of the peddling of snake oils if our scientific method was stronger to analyze those um, snake oil salesmen? So there's, there's that as well. So there, these things, they, they, they come together like peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> they really could. And, and, I, you know, there's been this long-standing um, antipathy between science and spirituality that you know, has some interesting historical roots. In particular, for example, the the treatment of Galileo by the Catholic Church. Yeah. Right? I mean, and 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 Alan Turing, even in the last uh, hundred years. Yeah. And that was yeah, that was um, uh, a society that was um, that really cruelly attacked him for being homosexual. Homosexual. Yeah. Right. So, so, in, in, so, so there's been this long standing antipathy be between science and spirituality, at least since Galileo and, and the Catholic Church. And, and Giordano yeah. Bruno burned at the stake. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff that, 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 that we don't want to have happening. And, and that's why it's, it's really critical to walk away from dogmatism. Yeah. Right. That's, that's dogmatism is the source source of all this, and it, you know it seems like um, most spiritual traditions would recognize that that humility is a virtue, yeah. and I would include in that humility about my beliefs, humility that I could be wrong, um, and especially when we have hundreds of different religious systems, many of which in the past have said that I'm right and all the other religions are wrong. Now, now we know that at most one of those hundreds could be right, right? And, and what's the probability that is mine? And, and so, so instead of going in that whole framework, it's, it's rather, why not have an attitude of, right, what, whatever the ultimate reality is, surely there's compassion for my ignorance and for what I got wrong. And there's, it, it, it's, and, Surely the, 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 the most healthy way for us to proceed is to listen to each other and to share. I don't have to believe what you say. You don't have to believe what I say. But, but I also don't need to kill you if you dis disagree with me. You don't need to kill me if I disagree. You know, and, and instead, we can have this, this humility to listen, maybe agree to disagree. Um, and then maybe later on in 10 years, I'll realize, oh, I was deeply wrong. And, you know, Sharon over there, she was deeply right. And I just didn't see it at the time, but I've grown up and now I see it. So, so just giving ourselves the time and the space to, to grow up and to, to learn uh, humbly. And, and, and that's the way I feel about the science. I mean, I, I'll say this. I love scientific theories. The, I study them. They're incredibly beautiful. And I don't think I've ever seen a true scientific theory. I think all scientific theories that I've studied so far are deeply false. They're the best we have so far. Yeah. But they're good enough in many cases to tell us where they're false. And that's the power of a theory where it, where it tells you yeah. where it gets off. And that's what I want in spirituality. There's a, a theory in spirituality that's good enough to tell me where it is inadequate and where it's beckoning me to now go for a deeper theory with a different level of understanding, but its own new inadequacies. And Gödel is suggesting that um, we will be doing this forever. <sighs> <sighs> Dr.
Don, I feel like the the edge pushing that's happening around um, bringing together science and spirituality, the edge pushing that's happening around um, understanding our source code, um, that that the, the topics that we've talked about and understanding that ultimate reality, um, I, I feel like um, the word integral and integrality are a very important um, phrase there because of um, just it, the integral and the derivative, but the integral in the sense of the integration of all um, perspective, but the d derivation in the sense of the um, each one of us having a unique experience in that candy store. Um, right. So yeah, yeah, and and in a unique artistic contribution or gift to bring to the world, and and um, that that's that's the ninety nine point nine percent genetic similarity integral and the point one percent genetic difference differentiation. Um, so that, yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. I, I, I think you raised an incredibly important point to view each person that you meet as a gift. They have a new perspective that's different from yours. And, and rather than putting up barriers to things that are foreign and novel to recognize that here's a chance for me to explore something that I, that I might not have ever, ever explored without interacting with this person. And, you know, this person, maybe I'm a geek that likes mathematics, and this person is an artist who likes painting and photography. Um, I can learn from their perspective, and they, they can learn from mine, and, and I can appreciate um, if I'm willing to open up and humbly listen and, and really listen, because I may not have the concepts yet. I may not have the point of view to really understand what that person is saying. Yeah. In which case, um, it's even more important for me to put in the time and effort because I'm going to have more to learn there. There's more that I can, can grow from that. So, so having that kind of view of, of our differences, that they're an opportunity to learn, to expand our horizons, um, and to realize that that, in some sense, perhaps is what life is all about, is constantly expanding our horizons and constantly um, in, enjoying new vistas. Yes. The vistas that we've had, we'd like to sit in our own vistas and say, this is it. Yeah. Hey, you know, that next mountain may have something even more fun. Yeah, the constant exploration of the Infinite Candy Store. I love this. It seems to make the most sense um, of the alternative being we already are all of the Infinite Candy Store combinatorics um, eternally happening. And that has a little bit more of maybe a, a nihilistic eternal return sense to it that we've been here before, we're doing this again. Um, but the the other one, the idea that there is just, it's never going to end the, the infinite exploration. Um, it has a little bit more adventure and it has a little bit more Darwinian metaphysical implications to it as well, where um, we need to take this seriously. We need to take our um, rock orbiting the star very seriously because um, if, if as above, so below, another spiritual wisdom is true. That's also scientifically validated that if natural selection is happening here between us, natural selection is all could also be happening at this cosmic level, not only in our universes, but universes competing um, against against one another for that recursion and how likely it is that, that they themselves get to those next tastes in the, the qualia uh, candy store. That's quite possible. That would be something I would really like to explore in this dynamics and graphs of, of conscious agents to see what, what in the world's going on here and what kind of dynamics are we using maybe to explore the candy store? Absolutely. Yeah. Don, I'm so, so grateful for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for everything that you're doing and that you've inspired so many people to think in refreshing and new ways and push the edge of what's known. We're very grateful to you. Thank you. Thank to you. all your lab, to all your students and lab and teammates um, as well. That, that's very important. The people behind the groove of the song. Right. Oh, absolutely. I couldn't have done it without uh, my graduate students and my, my collaborators, you know, you know, and I could name a bunch of them that, that um, frankly, um, push my ideas around all the time. And that's how I learn. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for tuning in. We are super grateful for you. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Check out the links in the bio below to both Don's website. Also his book, The Case Against Reality. Check that out. The book links there. It's one of the best books I've read. Would love for you guys to check it out and enrich yourselves with it and share it with other people as well. Also check out the link to uh, Don's Twitter profile as well. That's in the bio below. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the scientists around the world that you believe in in your community. Support them and help them grow. You can find our links in the bio below to our show. You can help support us as well. PayPal, Patreon, cryptocurrency, all those links are in the bio below. And go and build the future, everyone. Augment that source code tape and, uh, and build the new the new uh, deployments of, of code into our world. You can do it. Uh, we know you can be the Michelangelo and be the um, the Elon Musk and be the the be the ones that are just pushing the edge. The Rosalind Franklins um, for all our females out there, of course. Um, you know, be be that be that change maker um, and uh, and 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 do your best to unpack what our ultimate reality is a- along the way. So much love. Thank you everyone for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. Right.